So today I'm continuing my Rowan series, and I decided to look into the retail part of that. And I invited my friend, Ellen Lewis, the owner of Crazy For You in Leonard Town, Maryland. Did I pronounce the Leonard Town right? Yeah. You did. <laughs> it's on my map of like places to visit, actually, just because of your store. Like I, think I have to come one day. So you are one of the flagship stores. Tell me first, like, what does it mean to be a flagship store? Well, I think the intention is that when you are a flagship store, at least this is how I see it, because there isn't really a set of criteria. But but the idea is that when someone comes into a flagship store, they have an entire Rowan experience. It's like when you go into <clears throat> a department store and you see a boutique of a particular designer or a particular line of fragrance or something like that. When you walk into my store, the entire front of it is Rowan. It's like, oh my gosh. And I think the expectation is that you are going to carry all of their fibers and all of their colors so that if, and, and all of their pattern books. So if if a consumer comes in, a knitter comes in, or crocheter, and they want to make something that they've seen, you have the book, you have the yarn, you have the color, and you have it in a quantity sufficient for them to make that project. So um, I don't really look, sit down with my rep each season and say, oh, I think I might buy this or I might buy that. It's like, what's new? just write it up, you know, because whatever is new, whatever, whatever books are being put out there, I'm going to take all of them, whatever new yarns there are, I'm going to take all of them, whatever colors are being featured or introduced, I'm going to take all of them because I want to give the consumer the, the knitter the experience, you know, they can come in here and they know that they can get what they want from Rowan. Well, I understand why that's brilliant for Rowan. Why is it good for you? Why did you decide to become a flagship store? Well, I do love Rowan. I mean, I I love the quality of the yarns. I love working with the company. Um, my rep is great. And so, I mean, that was a big part of it. He really encouraged me because I was I was at a point where I was buying quite a bit. And it's always sort of been my way to invest in something if i you know i'm a sweater sweater focused store i mean we sell lots of stuff but i really do want to make sure that if people are making sweaters that we have enough for every size so i automatically was buying in the quantities that would be required for a flagship store and he he was saying you know there's just a few little yarns that you kind of need to have that would sort of bump you over into a flagship territory, you know, and I can 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 talk to the company and see, you know, about getting you that status. And so I thought about it and um I did think I wanted to do that because I wanted to have for me kind of a flagship brand, you mm -hmm. know, something that I could invest in and be supported by the company. And I really do feel like they do a good job supporting their flagship stores. I like having I like having a brand that has kind of everything and it's Rowan is is a quality brand it's well known but it's not I don't feel like it's overexposed you know not everyone in every yarn store everywhere you go has Rowan and if they do they certainly don't have it at the level and breadth that I do so that allows me to differentiate my store in a in a way, you know, because people come in and they're like, "Wow, you really carry Rowan." And it it tends to make the store a bit of a destination because we're not really in the center of a big city. So people have to travel to come here. So being a Rowan flagship makes my store a bit of a destination. Besides the fact that you have all the colors, I feel like you not just the surface style fan of Rowan like you actually know that yarn you knit with that yarn you know those design uh, m magazines like cover to cover <laughs> it's a sickness <laughs> well did, did 
that start before you became a flagship store? It's, it's sort of interesting because um, what really got me back into Rowan was the introduction of mode, which um, mode is sort of a, is a, a sub brand of Rowan and it's run by Quail Studio and it's definitely much more youthful and their their designs are are simple and clean and classic and i had been looking for something like that so i'd had another brand that was sort of looking for that sort of young slightly younger market and they kind of went off with their patterns and anyway i i fired them and so when when mode came out when rowan introduced mode and i had gone to their their retailer sort of summit, I guess it was in, it was before 2020. So we, we gathered in um, Philadelphia and they presented this new sub brand that they had, which was so clean and so fresh. And I was like, wow, you know, Rowan is really sort of looking at ways to attract a new market. And they, they're adding to what they're offering, not new yarns, but new designs, a new aesthetic for the younger market. And to me, I was like, wow, that's something that I can really get behind. I can bring the Rowan in full, but also have the same yarns in a subset that are specifically geared to a market I was trying to reach. Well, I remember like you and I talking about it a little bit and you said that like if sometimes you have a color that doesn't sell or a specific yarn that doesn't necessarily sell, if you just find the right pattern for that yarn to showcase it, suddenly it sells in that color. 100%. <laughs> Whatever color it is. So uh, here's a little secret. If, um, if I'm going to knit a sample, I'm going to knit a sample in the color that I have the most of whether I have the most of it because I just ordered a bunch for a particular set of projects that didn't come to fruition or it just didn't sell or whatever. Everybody wants the color of the sample. So if you just knit up a sample in a color, you know, boom, it's out the door. Well, it's also like often hard to imagine what certain yarn is going to look like knitted up. So like if you make a sample and it looks so cool. People just want that yarn just because they see it in the sample. That's true. I, I do try to steer people away from a color that they don't normally wear or don't enjoy typically simply because it's the sample. You know, I hear that so much and it's like, oh, don't do that. They'll say, oh, I, I never wear, you know, red or or whatever it doesn't suit me but it looks so pretty in the red i think i'll do the red and i'm like <laughs> do, do the color that that speaks to your heart do the color that you're gonna wear but you know it is it's hard to visualize an alternate color once you've seen a thing in a color it is hard to imagine it in another color how important it is for you personally the fact that Rowan spends like a lot of time tracing the origins of yarn and making sure that it's sustainable and going for like smaller meals and trying to create the story of each particular yarn. Like, was that a decision making factor? Probably not a decision making factor, but it is something that I value very much. Um, First of all, Rowan is a British brand and historically Great Britain was, you know, the the sheep capital of the universe. Right. And so it's sort of sad to have seen a lot of that manufacturing move away from Great Britain. And I'm excited about the idea that that they are focusing on British breeds like um, the Moordale is a 100 percent British yarn, British alpaca, British sheep. And I, I love that. And I, I do find like things like the Pebble Island. I love that they can trace that down to the Falkland Islands. And, you know, the colors are beautiful. They're all inspired by the agate that washes up on the shore there. So I do like that. And I think it's really, really important. Not so much that you know exactly where the yarn, where the wool came from, like that you can identify a particular uh 
flock, but to know that it comes from a shepherd or a community that is really looking after their sheep. There's so much horror in what's happening to animals in pursuit of profit. And I, I really hate that. So I do find that it's important for all the brands that I carry, not just Rowan, but Rowan is kind of leading the the charge on that to really, really be careful with where they get their yarn. And it is important. It wasn't a decision making factor because I, I decided to be part of the part of the um, the brand before they were doing so much of that. But um, I guess they were always doing it. And I just sort of been learning, learning more about it. Well, that's my next question. So you mentioned that there was this conference to present mode. Does Rowan spend time educating the owners of their stores, of places that sell their yarn, about the yarn? Or how do you get the information about the traceability, sustainability of that yarn? How do you learn? They have a really nice program. They do a presentation. And after 2020, they, you know, they used to do them in person. And then um, in 2020, they did them via Zoom, where they present the entire collection. And they start with the designs. So they show the designs that are going to be in the Rowan magazine. And they go through each and every design, who the designer is, you know, what the inspiration is. Um When you see one of these presentations, I mean, it kind of feels like you're at a runway show. Do you know what I mean? You're, you're seeing the collection. They have a story and it's a whole cohesive picture focused on a theme or a a particular yarn or whatever. And in going through that, you know, they kind of talk through the inspiration, um, the different designers and then the yarns that are being used. And if they have a new yarn, they're going to they're going to present that new yarn and they're going to talk about why it's special and how the inspiration for that came up and why they introduced it to the line so that's really good plus i think they do a really good job of educating their reps i don't know if every rep is like mine my rep is amazing and he's been in the industry for forever and he knows you know so he i think spends a lot of extra time sort of figuring out what's going on and they may you know rowan may have a another level of training that they give their reps that they then expect their reps to give the store owners that's how it's worked for me so um and you know the thing that's nice is that everybody at rowan is very accessible if i were to send an email to david and say david tell me about this yarn or you know erica talk to me about denim revive tell me this story they're able to do that. And everybody from Sharon and David all the way, you know, Trisha all the way down to, you know, just everybody, they all know the story of the brand and they know about the yarns. So it's it's like this whole ecosystem that you can well, tap into. It's also interesting to me that like the top executives of that brand are all knitters and passionate knitters and very knowledgeable knitters who, like who are obsessed with yarn and the yarn story and the and the British yarn and those animals and everything. So I find it like very refreshing. It's not just this cold corporation that where some people who know nothing about the actual thing rule the world. Like they are actually very knowledgeable knitters. A hundred percent. And you know, there are certain designers that Rowan has, I call them um stable designers because I sort of think about, you know, them being the the racehorses in the Rowan stable. You know, they've been they've been with Rowan such a long time and they're not just designers for Rowan. They, I mean, they are designers for Rowan, but they're not just designing. They have input into the yarn and the colors. And I think that's probably one of the most important aspects about Rowan is that their whole business model is led by the designers. You know, they start with the designers. You know, they maybe have a theme or something, but but it's it's a collaborative process. It's not, okay, we've decided on the yarns, we've decided on the colors because we did some, um, you know, statistical analysis and looked at the Pantone colors and here are the colors, go off and do something with it. No, that they reach out to 
their stable of designers and to independent designers and they say, you know, what do you think? And and there's a it's an iterative process, you know, back and forth between the designers and the the management and the, you know, the knitting and and they really do take their their customers and I don't mean their customers, their retail customers, they do that, but they look at the end user. They look at the knitter. And I know for a fact that they have a, a matrix for their designs that are by level of skill and by the kinds of bodies that this thing might might fit, you know, things that are going to be very flattering on somebody who's a size you know, 30 inch bust and somebody who's going to be, um, you know, at the other end of the scale, they, they look to have designs that are going to resonate with each of them. And they're very big on diversity too. So if you look at their, at their models, they've got, you know, a whole raft of models showcasing their designs so that knitters can really get a sense of, wow, that's how that would look on me, right. which I love. Well, you mentioned 2020 and the lockdown, and that was a tough time. I know you and I talked about it. And you mentioned that you called David for help, and he came through. Tell me that story. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I hadn't been a flagship very long, and but I, I gosh, I'm, I'm losing track of how everything went, but... Bottom line is I had taken um, receipt of the order and it, it was a big order and um, it came in like the first of March, right? And so I'm just putting this stuff up and I'm starting to hear whispers about what's going on and, you know, that won't happen to us. And the next thing you know, the whole world shuts down, right? So I have a yarn store full of yarn that I have just put out on the you know, in the display and I've got the, you know, the patterns and this, yes. <laughs> and no one could come in the store. Nobody knew what I had. And, um, I, I think I even had a trunk show. And so I, I called David and I'm like, can I have you do a yarn tasting with me? Can we meet and talk about the new yarns that are in and, you know, just work through them and share them with my customers. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. You know, and he was so charming and so wonderful. Um, I sent him a list of stuff that I wanted to talk about, the yarns that I wanted to feature. And, you know, we we had kind of a back and forth, sort of like this, you know, talking about the new yarns. That, that was the season that they introduced Summer Light, Summer Light DK and Summer Light 4-ply. Possibly that was the introduction of Cotton Cashmere. But anyway, beautiful yarns and people tuned in and they watched and they were excited to, you know, to share. And I had put together a little tasting kit, which I do every season that you can, you know, that my customers can buy if they're not local. Um, they can buy a copy of the magazine and the tasting kit with a sample of all the yarns and sort of go through that with us. So it was such a nice way for him to open himself up and you know, share the excitement of this new season, even though nobody could be in the store. Right, so nice. that was special. And I watched that and it was like very special. Like you, I could, it felt like you guys were best friends, you know, <laughs> he, he's like very lovely in this way. And he's like very open and loves to share his knowledge. And he's very knowledgeable about yarn. And you can also sense that he's very passionate about the whole process and he likes to say that he's geeking out like about the all the how the yarn is being made. So he's like a perfect person to explain all the qualities of yarn. And what I found interesting that you two have the same favorite yarn in the own line. Soft Jack DK. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me why. Tell me why is it? And by the way, like I'm I'm knitting with the uh, yak uh, now, and it's just like the most luxurious feeling fiber, and it gives such a beautiful stitch definition. But like I was listening to you too, so tell me why it's your favorite. Okay, I mean it's not fair to really have a favorite, right? I have four kids, no <laughs> favorites. <laughs> but there's something really special about soft yak DK. Um, first of all, it's a cotton blend. All right, I like it. 
because um, it feels really soft. Nobody, I mean, certainly there are people who have wool issues and they're just like, oh, I don't like wool. But it's very hard to find a cotton that doesn't feel like ugh, cotton. Mm -hmm. And soft yak decay is one of those fibers that maintains the softness of the cotton. And then with that little bit of yak in there, it's so luxurious. But what makes it really special is it's what they call a modern construction. It's, it's not, you know, so new anymore. People are used to seeing chainette. But when it was introduced, it was a fairly new, um, new construction to have this chainette yarn, which, as you know, is a tiny little eye cord, right? So the yarn has been knitted and it gives the yarn this beautiful bounce. So it's a cotton that knits like a wool. Right. So even if you can't enjoy wool, you can still knit with this yarn and get that beautiful elasticity and bounce. So it makes it a really pleasant yarn to knit with. Um, and then that little bit of yak in there. So you know that yak doesn't take the dye all that well or it takes it differently than the cotton mm -hmm. does. <clears throat> so even though it's a solid yarn, because the cotton and the yak fibers have been um, blended together before they're spun, you get this wonderful sort of heathery aspect to the yarn. It's more visible in the lighter colors, but you get a little bit of um, heather. Right. Yeah, you get a little color. So the other thing I really like about Soft Jack DK is it's really round and it has great stitch definition. So cables in it really pop, but the chain net construction makes it light. So you can get a heavily textured or cabled summery kind of garment that doesn't feel heavy. You know, this is a year round yarn. Well, talking about year-round yarn, like there are certain yarns that people are either allergic to or just not in their budget. Do people come often to you to ask for possible substitutions? And is it possible to substitute within the row online? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't think that there's a direct substitute for, for maybe every yarn. But um, similar yarns, like if you, for some reason or other, you couldn't find the color that you wanted in Soft Jack DK, you could substitute something like um, Rowan Cotton Wool, which is also a DK weight chainette construction. It's like 60-40 uh, wool cotton. Um, yeah, I, I try, when we substitute yarn, I really try to think about more than just the gauge. You know, you have to think about um, the the physical weight of the yarn, like there's really no substitute for kid silk case. You know, if you don't want to use kid silk case, then maybe you ought to pick a different project. <laughs> but um, you can substitute, but I would say that it's one of the things that's super nice is that they don't have a lot of duplicates. You know, they don't have three different versions of basically the same thing, which you find in some companies that have just a ton a ton of yarn and Rowan has a lot of yarn make no mistake they have a lot of different yarns but there there isn't a, a real redundancy right well they also have their core yarns and then they have the seasonal or like some surprise kind of yarns um talk a little bit about that what that's about is um of course having a nice basic line, which is, you know, what every flagship store is expected to have, like we talked about. But since they don't necessarily have a brand new yarn every season, sometimes they'll put out a limited edition yarn that's really special. And, um, you know, it's not meant to go into the core line, but it's it's a fun and fanciful kind of thing. It's a, you know, it it generates excitement. It's a here today, better buy it because it's not going to be here next season. It's not available. And, you know, everybody loves something that's a limited edition, especially if it's like a little bit of a luxury thing. You know, you're like, oh, I'm just going to get a couple skeins because it's really special. I think that that feeds the consumer demand for new and exciting without m muddying the, the core yarn. When you were on my channel last time, we talked about your personal stash. How much of that limited edition <laughs> ends up there? <laughs> well, I must say I have quite a bit of cashmere. 
<laughs> <It's> stashed. <laughs> but I'm the kind of person that if there's a limited edition, I'm going to knit it up right away. You know, if there's a nim- limited edition, something that I really love, I'm, I'm going to pull it and I'm going to knit it up because I want to promote it. I want to show everybody and, and I'm excited about it, you know? So it's funny. I don't pull stuff for my stash. I just leave it on the shelf. And I feel like if, um, if I have my eye on something and somebody else buys it, you know, I would rather that they have it because I can always order more. <laughs> right. Wasn't meant to be. Exactly. Exactly. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm here for my customers. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a hobby. Right. Well, when you do the um, sample needs, you have, some, you, you're not the only one who's doing sample needs for the store. You do some and then other people do some. Do you have like certain yarn that you always gravitate to knit with personally? Me personally? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I like carrying kids sale case with other things. I mean, I love like I did a, a coat a um, couple seasons ago called the Moss Cardigan. It was cotton cashmere carried with kids sale case. I mean, I think you could put kids sale case with anything and it would just be amazing. Um, I don't have one one yarn that I, I gravitate to. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's the design Um, I do love, I love all of them. Again, it's, it's hard, but I do love Kids Sell Case an awful lot. Not by itself. I don't knit with Kids Sell Case by itself at all, ever. Right. What's your best-selling yarn from Rowan? Or well, like, are there a few best-selling yarns? Yeah, Felted Tweed and Kids Sell Case. And do people buy like specific color? Is there like color that you cannot keep enough of on your shelves? Well, you know, the thing about it is there's 30 or 40 colors of, of felted tweed and we stock all of them. Um, it's not, it's not like one color or the other that people can't get enough of. The thing about felted tweed and Kids Hill Case both, but felted tweed in particular is that it's so perfect for color work. So people will buy it because you can have two colors that are just so slightly different, but different enough that they create that sort of a gradient in, in the project. So if you look at, at some of Kaif's things, you know, Kay Facet does this beautiful color work and it's all about shading. You know, he's an artist and he does this beautiful, you know, very subtle gradation of colors and Felted tweed allows you to do that. I mean, so if you look at, at these two colors, I was just putting them on the shelf today. These are two different colors of felted tweed. Right. Like right. Very light the, variation. The, just this most subtle difference. I mean, it, it looks more substantially different in the camera, but if you look at them sort of far away from the camera, they're really, really close. <laughs> um, And I, I love that. So felted tweed is huge because you can get that painterly kind of effect with it. And Kids Hill Case is a great seller because people use it in Rowan designs, but they also use it in every other, with every other yarn that I carry, right? It's, there's always something that will be enhanced by a strand of Kids Hill Case. You know, it, you can use it to bump the gauge on something. You can use it to soften the line uh, between two, two colors. Or, you know, if you have an issue with some kind of a dye lot, if you carry a strand of Kids Hill Haze with it, it's going to be a lot less noticeable. So Kids Hill Haze is a really great seller for that reason, because it's not just a rowing yarn. It's a, it's a resource. <laughs> Right. Well, I know that you are very passionate about perfectly fitting sweater and you love the satin sleeves. You love doing all the finishing work on sweaters. Is there any Rowan designer that speaks to you on because of that level, that sort of connection? Yeah, really kind of, of all of them. I had a great conversation with Martin Story when we were talking about this, um, this Afghan that he's doing about the the tailored shape and that kind of fit you know um kim hargreaves has just retired this year but i am such a fan of her stuff because it's 
perfectly tailored. It's not all set in sleeve, but the fit is exactly like it's supposed to be. You know, and Lisa Richardson is that way. Martin Story is that way. Um, all of their all of their designs. They have a really classic one. I I think it's a Lisa Richardson. It's called um, the Perfect Sweater, and it's just felted tweed, and you can do it in any color you want. It comes in a cropped version, comes in a um, standard length, V neck, crew neck. It's just this beautiful basic sweater that you can knit in any DK weight yarn and it looks great. And it does have the set in sleeves and the tailoring is, is perfect. And I think people, particularly in the United States, they really are opposed to seaming. And <laughs> it, it makes me sad um, because seams can really allow you to create a a kind of fit that you're not going to get from any other construction method. Well, I was, when I was talking to Cave Fawcett, uh, I sort of asked him this question that his designs are having like, it's fair aisle. It's, it's all about color, right? It's color driven. So there is a lot of intarsia in fair aisle. And I said, you know, like when a lot of people hear the word intarsia, they just run away screaming, you know, they're not even going to touch that pattern. Do you feel like Rowan does a good job at promoting and pushing knitters to try new skills, to try new patterns, new kind of techniques for them? 100%. Like like this particular afghan that I was talking about when I was talking with Martin's story, um, it's stranded and it's not stranded in the round. So this has worked flat. And a lot of people really have angst about stranding flat because that means they have to, to work it on the pearl side. Mm-hmm. But he knows that. And so he was really careful when he did the motifs to make them kind of straightforward and they're doing a knit along. So they they do a lot, I think, of outreach in terms of trying to provide lessons and guidance to help people over that the fear of doing something. Because when you have when you feel like you have this support where you can see a video and you know Rowan is is there, you know, Martin is doing it and ev- everybody all over the world is doing it and they have a place you can post your pictures or ask questions. Then it doesn't feel quite so alone. So I do think that that they are looking to educate and bring their their knitters along to the next step. Do you feel like the owners of flagship stores also have that sense of community of belonging? Like, are you guys a team? So um, at at stitching events or you know other kind of trade events like h and h you remember you were there with me we went into the rowan um they had a a suite there and they had you know snacks and drinks and everything and they had they had events for rowan flagship store owners so we could go in and you know chat with each other and see the the new yarn that was coming out this season and they had the samples there so that was really nice and it you know it was it was a chance for us to kind of all get together and you know, meet in person rather than just on Zoom. So that was really fun. And I think I think that kind of thing is something that Rowan is really trying to promote and encourage among flagship store owners. Uh, you're telling me a story that like you had Arnie and Carlos in your store. Was that part of the Rowan connection also? Absolutely. So that was that was amazing. They were doing a US tour and I was honored to be one of the flagship stores that they came came to teach at and they taught um they taught two days worth of classes there was a um an evening before um where they did this adorable presentation they had slideshows and i mean they're just so funny you know and there was a book signing really warm and personable people you know so they were there everybody was amazing we had people coming from all over and then they did class on um the next they for the next two days and they taught four different classes on four different techniques. And it was, it was really wonderful. We had such a fun time and having them be, you know, be in the store that, that, that makes, makes it so wonderful. And I wouldn't, I certainly would not have had that opportunity if I had not been a Rowan flagship store. Right. And I've heard, like, I've heard that prior to 
COVID that, you know, that this is how most of the instructors and most of the designers did their classes. They would go to the flagship store and teach there in person. Now there is like more and more things done over Zoom. And you've had uh, Georgia Farrell on your channel uh, and David and Martin's story. Yeah. And, and Sharon and, Sharon. and, and Brandon Mabley and, you know, just that's been really fun. I mean, there's a there's an openness and a willingness um, in the company to sort of be present for you, you know, which is, is so nice, you know? Well, what are you looking forward the most when it comes to Ron? Is there some event or something they do that like really excites you? I hope that they, they get with the... Um, you know, back together, you know, to present the the new line. I think it would be fun to have those um, coming back together, you know, traveling to a particular place and seeing the presentation and being able to be in person with folks. Um, I also think Rowan is probably going to be at more of the trade shows. I'll probably have a larger presence at H&H &H in the future. And I'm really excited about that because they, when they go and, and set up, it is amazing. They consistently have the most beautiful booth. It's very chic and the it's just it's an event, you know. They do a beautiful job with everything that they do. Well, you're gonna come with me next year and we're gonna be roommates again, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so fun. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It's gonna be early. It's and I, I understand they maybe have a surprise uh keynote speaker. Ooh. Looking forward to that. Absolutely. Well, I hope to find myself in Leonardtown, Maryland one day soon you at will. your store in person. But if not, I'll see you at H&H. &H. It's a standing date. Absolutely. <laughs> Sounds great. I'm Thanks looking so forward to it, Irina. Thanks so much, Ellen. Thank you for Thank being you. with us today. Mm -hmm.